we welcome you all to our uh, today's series. Today is our Max, our uh, second series on the fourth uh, uh, part of the webinar for goals and dreams. And uh, I, your host, uh, Elijah Muchunguzi. I am an investment advisor here at Zeno Investment Management Limited. And um, before we dive into today's topic, I would just love to introduce to you uh, Zeno and what we do and how actually it can help you. So Zeno is an investment uh, management firm. Uh, first of all, we are located at Wackett's house, uh, first floor. That is where offices are. And with Zeno, we help you plan, save, and invest for your financial goals. So whatever financial goal that you have, be it buying a plot of land, uh, buying your dream car, ETC, we, we are able to help you plan for that dream goal of yours help you save towards it. So as you're getting your monthly salary, weekly allowances, ETC, that Kameza money, we're able to actually help you uh, save up and also help you invest that money using our unit trust fund. So we operate using four unit trust funds and that is the Zeno Uganda Bond Fund, Zeno Uganda Money Market Fund, uh, Zeno Uganda Domestic Equity Fund and Zeno Uganda uh regional equity fund yeah uh, so we invest using those funds uh, so that your man uh, your money can actually grow and can yield you returns uh, for more information we shall share all those details uh, at the end of the webinar and now uh, in today's topic something that cuts across each and uh, every one of us today's topic we are talking about uh, panic proof yeah. So in, in simple language here, we're discussing about the essence of you having an emergency fund. Um, each and every one of us has an emergency. And I will uh, definitely share a, a, a short story about my life and especially a, a, uh, and the turning point. Yeah, I did share it today early morning uh, on my on my on my social media page. Uh, so. One morning about, uh, that was about five years back, uh, I was still then uh, at the university. Uh, so you, um, if you're Ugandan, you definitely know that Ginger Road Crossroad, yeah, that T-junction, um, one from Kampala, one from Ginger Road, the other one from uh, the side of um, Garden City, and then this one from Industrial Area. So one evening, I was definitely on a border heading uh, towards, uh, of course, going towards Kampala. And so um, you know how border people don't really obey all those traffic rules. So um, they decided to let the, the cars from the, from, from, from the um, side of the industrial area to actually cross through. Now, what happened is my border guy, I don't know what happened or I don't know what possessed him at that moment, he decided of all the cars that were moving, he decided to choose a Sino truck. Yeah. So, and, and, and uh, I just, I don't know how we bypassed, but it was narrow. Like I survived narrowly. Uh, the thing that helped me is that, um, is that uh, there was a side, I think the side mirror something was like, I was hit by the truck, but on the side. So I never got like sustained, like real um, thorough injuries and ETC, uh, but I was still conscious and everything. And, um, but at that moment, uh, I did not even really have money on myself to actually go to the hospital. Yeah. So I had to uh, do some basic uh, first aid and ETC. Now, I'm sure each and every one of us has actually had a moment in their lives. Yeah. When they have go gotten, um, a shock. I mean, either it could be a road accident, it could be your child that gets ill in the middle of the night, maybe at 2 a.m., uh, or or your parent or anything. Yeah. I mean, we all have emergencies, but how prepared are we for these emergencies? Yeah. And so as we go ahead, it is my hope and prayer that you just don't only listen to us, but you actually put this into action and set up an emergency fund after this. 
But as we go forward, I am not alone. I'm very, very excited today. I am joined by two very, very important panelists, uh, people that have actu uh, actually also personally impacted on my life. That is a story for uh, another day. Uh, but uh, on this panel with me uh, is um, um, Namayanja. She is um, an auditor with KPMG, but she also has a YouTube channel uh, called Financial Literacy in Luganda. Uh, a few of you might know her. And um, also with me is John Semogere. Uh, he's also a, a chartered financial analyst that works with Zeno, a head of uh, investor relations here at Zeno Management. And so I would just let the panelists um, introduce themselves. Over to you, Miriam. Uh, thanks, Elijah, and thanks everyone who has joined in and those yet to join in. Thanks, Zeno and the team for setting this up. As you've mentioned, I'm Miriam Namanja, um, an auditor, and um, but also a YouTuber on the side, I like to do my own stuff. And I enjoy talking about money. That's what I do most of the time. So happy to be here, happy to share with you guys. And I hope by the end of this session, we'll have learned something. We'll have had uh, another building block on our financial lives. Thanks. Thank you very much. Over to you, John. Yeah, thank you, like uh, Miriam. John Semogerere is my name. I work with Zeno Investment Management as the head of investor relations. We're in charge of ensuring that we manage the client's money as per the mandate given to us by the Capital Markets Authority. Thank you guys for joining in. I'm happy to be here and to learn from all of you. Thank you, John. Thank you, Miriam, for... Uh honoring our invitation to join us today and now straight to the topic of today uh, over to you Miriam uh, in your experience as uh, a financial coach and engaging with people both in Uganda and in the diaspora um, is the concept of having an emergency fund well known to you oh thanks and <laughs> well I'm going to split my response um, between these two groups that you said before me. So first for our Ugandan people, all the people that are um, currently home, the concept is still yet to sink in. And for some people, you really give them a benefit of doubt or an excuse cause life can really be hard. If you look at the statistics, you realize that people who are able to even earn a million shillings are, are like really a very small percentage and these are people who have families these are people who have school going children so even to find a meal like for tomorrow it's hard these are people earning hand to mouth so everything in their life is typically an emergency <laughs> like something happens to one child at that point they are they are done or they are going to just get into a, some never-ending hole of financial pro problems and if you're in that category um we're not saying there's no hope for you. There's still hope because sometimes you just need a light bulb moment to find a solution to your problem. So there's still hope for such kinds of people. And then we have this other category where it's due to total unseriousness or lack of proper guidance. And, and our system hasn't really helped that much. Our life system where you grow up, go to school, um, study get a job and then adulting kicks in and if they have not told you adulting comes head on like there is no <laughs> there is no way where you're going to be prepared to be like an adult so imagine you've gone to school and meanwhile your village mates or parents and everyone are expecting you to be the one to guide them with their finances because they are thinking well you you're the land person so guide me on this investment guide me on insurance guide me on this all these other things not knowing your level of insurance doesn't your level of education does not actually have a direct correlation with how well you handle money some of us we have our parents who studied up to beginner levels or have even never attended school but then they've done so well with their finances they have handled quite well so 
as you know, level of education does not directly correlate. You've been trained to be a doctor. You can extract teeth, treat them, do all sorts of root canals, but life never prepared you or you are never prepared with skills to handle the money that comes out of this accountants we have very brilliant people you just work them out of their sleep and you're like hey can you sort for me this trial balance and they'll be able to do it they'll be able to categorize uh, assets into the different classes they categorize their reserves but come to their finances it's it's really total chaos so we 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 can learn from what our forefathers did but then new seasons need new ways of dealing with issues. We can just twitch around some bits and we actually miss using the Ubuntu spirit. You know how people expect that your friends or your family are the ones who are going to be able to handle your emergencies. And we've seen a lot of toxicity that has arisen out of this, especially those emergencies that, uh, that you would have prepared for before, like where you needed to plan before. So we cannot now just keep doing it that way and then going on to our diaspora people well we come to these countries with a lot of excitement or excitement finds us there sometimes <laughs> yeah and then you want to look or you want to feed your egos and then you want to look the expectation of people back home because there is a certain picture which Ugandans expect people in the diaspora to be looking like so you go and get um, adopted into this credit culture, especially uh, our diaspora people in Europe and US, there is a really bad credit culture out there. Actually, I never realized I would one day reach a point and thank God for our backward financial systems. Because imagine if we had easy access to credit with the way our country is no levels of financial literacy like people would be you see how our depression levels are so high like we would be now way bad so um you find um us get excited when you go to these countries we use all our money to buy all these other things that are not essential just to eh, get into the hype and then show off that well uh, my status has changed and then emergencies kick in and then you're just running into credit or like different kinds of loans, not knowing you're digging yourself deeper into some never ending pit. But yeah, the concept is yet to kick in and thank God for Zeno and other financial coaches who have tried to um, share their knowledge with different people and then equipping different people with skills on how to handle different emergencies. Uh, you never know. <laughs> Uh, the concept will start kicking in and then we'll be better managers of our money, especially after the session today. So that is really my experience on on how people are doing with it. Thank you very much, Miriam. Uh, that was a really, really uh, nice way. I mean, you're saying that uh, our backward way has actually helped us uh, avoid getting credit. I mean, for unwanted things, I would definitely say thumbs up. That is really, really good. Um, over to you, John, uh, on, uh, from our Ugandan perspective, uh, and typically in responding to emergency financing emergencies, what challenges does that have, uh, in, cre in literally our long-term financial health? So when an emergency does happen, for example, the recent, uh, COVID-19, uh, breakout, uh, I would say what, uh, what challenges does has it actually, or would uh, an emergency cause to our long-term financial health? Over to you, John. Okay, thank you, Elijah and Miriam, for those words about emergencies. We have to accept that emergency, or preparing for emergencies or setting up a rainy day fund is a new concept for the Ugandan market. Not only the Ugandan market, but Africa at large. Very few people take deliberate efforts to set aside a given portion of their income to prepare for emergencies. In fact, most of the people I know, even looking, reflecting on my life when I was growing up, only prepare for emergencies in terms of the uh, people they engage with. Most of the uh, people I know evaluate their friendships and relationships in terms of who can be on their side in case of an emergency. So it's really a new concept. And when you go back in 
for most of the people at the low or the bottom of the pyramid, they have no idea of how they can even plan for emergencies. Because as media demonstrated, almost everything which comes to them is an emergency. Even a bill of 35K for Medicare for their kids is an emergency. So we still have a lot of work to do, but in terms of the challenge this creates is that, first of all, most of these emergencies take away the labor which has to be provided. Since most of these guys earn daily wages, for example, border border riders or taxi guys or women which, who work in markets, most of these guys earn daily income. And when they get sick, most of the time they'll have, first of all, they have to look for money to, for treatment. On top of that, they will lose their daily income, which they have to use to take care of their kids or their families. So we lose two ways. First of all, we use the, the labor, which has been lost to sickness. Or, and also, since they didn't prepare for that emergency, they have to solicit extra funds to take care of that. And what has been happening of recent, what I've noticed is loan sharks, mostly for people at the bottom of the pyramid have taken advantage of this. And if you guys have noticed, those who move around on weekdays in our villages, you'll notice people who are congregating and they have a book and they have a loan officer who is taking them through how they can access loans. These guys are giving people loans at very unattractive rates of, the, in fact, they're giving them double digit loans. Since these guys didn't prepare for, they don't even prepare for fees for the next term, they live a highly indebted life to the end. And they have multiple loans from several service providers, mostly tier three financial institutions, circles. And these guys, they are in markets, and if you guys have been moving around, you will see in any market, there are guys who move around in the evening with books where people either, they are paying back loans, which they took at the start of the month. So in terms of debt, yeah, these guys are really indebted since they are not very well for emergencies. And also part of it is an income issue, honestly. Most of the uh, people in this country don't have enough funds to take care of their basic needs. So they end up in a vicious cycle of soliciting more loans in order to take care of their emergencies. I think a lot of financial literacy has to be done and also give them more options to save. Because right now, the options which are currently available for savings and investment are only available to people in the middle, yeah, in the middle of the pyramid. People who are at the bottom of the pyramid do not have any access to any financial services, and the financial services which are available to them are only exploiting them. Yeah, that is it, Elijah. Thank you, John. That was well, that was really, really helpful. And and uh, just to add on to John's voice, uh, majority of us, I would say, even from that time we get our first jobs and we have started making um, a bit of money, normally that money is not planned for. We don't actually plan for it. So we end up, uh, we are in what we call the vibes generation. Yeah, we are all over the bars. We want to really, and we are actually not, um, having enough to actually spare for emergencies. And that is what you were saying. We end up living an indebted life, yeah? So your next month's salary is having to go and actually fund last month's debt, yeah? And so I'm just hoping that uh, from here, you uh, pick a lesson, adjust on your lifestyle so that you can actually plan for these emergencies. On your screen uh, should be a poll that is running, um, should be asking you how many months worth of expenses have you, have you actually saved up in your uh, emergency fund, yeah? So please take off time and uh, click what is, um, what literally is, um, you do literally in your daily life, yeah? Um, so now we're going straight to defining what an emergency fund is, yeah? Uh, so 
The first thing we need to do is to distinguish between a genuine emergency and uh, a non-urgent emergency. So over to you, Miriam, what would you define as a genuine emergency and a non-genuine emergency? Thanks. Well, we need to first define what an emergency is before you can be able to, to say which one is genuine, which one is not genuine. So an emergency is an unforeseen situation, a combination of circumstances whose um, um, end result requires immediate attention, like you need to deal with it, else there, there are serious consequences that you're going to suffer from that. And um, the best way to look at this or to, to, so, to say which situation is an emergency and which is not is to look at the basic needs of a human being, like what do you need to be able to survive? And this um, food, you need to eat, air, um, uh, water and shelter, they're just four. They are not easy, like thank God air is not charged, otherwise so many of <laughs> us or so many people in the world will be dead. But then food, like that's why we were able to have some people who don't have access to money yet they're able to survive because they're able to get food especially people in the villages they can try to get water and then shelter but then as when when you're not in a situation where you can easily get these then anything happens where your access to food is threatened you need to deal with that immediately say you've lost your income because sometimes it's not just food by itself but then how are you able to get food so is um, you've lost access to income or you've lost your job, meaning you won't be able to feed yourself. Uh, you won't be able to be able to buy water for use in case you don't have a wall nearby or access to clean water, then that becomes an emergency. You won't be able to pay for your rent. So your shelter is threatened or your house has flooded. You're not paying rent, but your house owner, your house has flooded. Well, you're not going to stay in a flooded house. So you have to deal with that immediately. So the best way to for you to sort which one is do I need to deal with which one can I categorize as an emergency and which one can be a normal expense? I would suggest you you um, go through a three-step model, which is you have to ask yourself, is it unexpected? You, you've seen people who, like I've, I have friends where Christmas always comes as if it's it's abrupt for them this is a day that has existed for years on the very same day and then one week to christmas someone realizes well if i don't actually have food at home and then i have to give gifts to this and this other person you're like guy you've had a whole year <laughs> this day has not shifted so why does this need look like an emergency why are you going ahead to borrow for something that you knew was going to happen so that is the first bit is it unexpected then another question you need to ask yourself is it necessary for you to to incur that expense you, you abruptly you've received a message um your friends very very tight friends you've been with these guys since you grew up and they are planning a visit to mombasa at, at some point, maybe next week, you're like, wow. And then you start calling your friends. So I've got an emergency, like <laughs> my clique is traveling. I, I need urgent money. Can you please get me some five miles refund it to you next week? But is it really, is it necessary for you to go on that trip? Yeah. Is it a matter of life and death? So another thing you need to ask yourself is, is it urgent or can it be postponed? Say, you know, we have people, okay, I don't know if, oh, in Uganda, they are there. You know, these people who have like five cars, uh, one is for like normal town runs, another one is like your weekend car and then another one maybe up country or what. So one of those breaks down and you're like, is it urgent for you to, um, to sort it right now? Or can you just use the rest of the resources that you have and then you'll come back to that later so that is what for every kind of expense or for every kind of situation that is set before you ask yourself is it unexpected um is it necessary 
hand, is it urgent after you've gone through that and you need to assess every expense through that three-step model? So if, if, uh, if your transaction, if your expense ticks all those three, then that qualifies to be an emergency and you need to sort it immediately, else there are going to be some very serious circumstances. That's it, Elijah. Yeah, thank, thank you, Miriam. Uh, at least now we have all gotten to know what qualifies to be an emergency and one that does not qualify to actually be an emergency. You're going to Dubai there and then just to do shopping. It's not an emergency, yeah? An emergency should be something related at least with health or something that is really, you know, it's a matter of life and death, yeah? That's what we call an emergency. Now, over to you, John. What is the recommended amount to have an emergency fund and uh, what different guidelines would you give to individuals, uh, couples and families? Over to you, John. Okay, I won't deviate very much from the explanation of Miriam about the definition of an emergency. And I also agree that that should be the step, those should be the steps which should be used when defining an emergency. But in terms of there are very many ways of looking at an emergency, so a rainy day fund and how much you should contribute to that fund. Most of the times people think of them when they have a sustained level of income, maybe you are receiving a monthly salary and you decide that my emergency should be worth at least three months of my salary. So you start piling it up until it is at least three months of your monthly salary. So that is one way to look at it. But there are some people who do not have any monthly salary where their levels of income fluctuate depending on the nature of business they are dealing in. There, you can also evaluate the amount or the portion of the amount you want to put aside, maybe based on past experience of the level of emergencies which have been coming to you, or you can look at similar circum circumstances which have been happening to the people in your vicinity and see how much it has taken away from them. Or you can also look at the level of assets you're having and decide that my emergency should be at least 10% of the level of my assets. And the mis sometimes the mistake we make is we want to pile up all this in maybe in a one-time investment, which is not a good deal. Most of the times the most recommended would be is to pile up this emergency fund over time and also not piling it in non-liquid investments. The best way is to pile up your emergency fund first in liquid assets, which you can liquidate in case an emergency comes up. And still, you should also not put your emergency fund in risky assets. Risk assets can range from real estate, equities, and any other risk asset you know. In terms of liquidity, what most of us do, and I've noticed this trend with many Ugandan is to, first of all, they always put their emergencies either in land, they can buy land and they don't do anything with it, or they can put trees, or they can put up rentals. All these are good things for building up wealth, but they won't protect you in case an emergency shows up. So it's good discipline to always speak to a financial advisor or a consultant to gauge whether this is the right tool you should use to prepare for your emergencies. Because right now, the biggest culture amongst us is your emergencies, everyone is emergency. And we even lose friends if we don't help them in their emergencies. But I think everyone should start taking care of these emergencies by, by planning for it, use the three-step definition Miriam has illustrated, and also speak to an advisor consultant and start putting a smaller portion. The most important thing is consistency. And also try on a whole now to automate that saving. If you are earning a monthly salary, automate that at the point when that where that payment is made from such that it is taken a what source automate that then it will become a culture where you don't have to think of the 
maybe 10% or 20% of your side, you take it as a tax. Because at the end of the day, when an emergency doesn't show up, this is your money. No one is going to take it away from you. Yeah, that is it from me, Elijah. Thank you, thank you very, very much, John, uh, for that. Uh, and just to just to ask uh, both you and Miriam uh, on your, just to pick your mind on uh, still in line with the emergency fund, but now us going towards the side of insurance. Is insurance something that is important to us in handling emergencies? Yeah, should we uh, should we just have an emergency account like in any bank account or something, or should we also have diversify and have a bit of insurance cover for health and etc? Uh, let's start with you, Miriam. Thanks. Well, there's an analogy I, I got from uh, someone when I was doing my rounds on researching about finances. And then this person was like, your insurance portfolio protects your investment portfolio. So those two go hand in hand. And when you to look at an emergency fund, an emergency fund falls into the insurance portfolio it's level one insurance but as we've shared um as john has said like you find your emergency fund is sort of um linked to your level of expenditure like how much are you able to spend um in a given period of time say three to six months and then after that you'll be able to sort yourself or you will have figured out something but some expenses come where even your emergency fund can't handle or the magnitude is way beyond your income as well or beyond your uh, asset value so this is where insurance kicks in an emergency fund can only go as far but insurance has to come in where you're not able to replace that asset that item immediately um say your car has has been totaled yeah and it costs 20 millions meanwhile you have you've just started organizing your finances and you have your one million at zeno in your emergency fund and you're just starting to build your investment portfolio you so far have 500k meanwhile your car is getting totaled so you won't be able to replace this this is where insurance comes in you insure your car so that at least you have that um that peace of mind that if anything come happens to my asset i i won't be like i won't be going into debt to be able to sort it or i won't have a very big inconvenience with my life if that something has happened so insurance is totally necessary when you when you um looking at a stable or a, a proper financial life thank you very much uh, miriam for that uh to you john uh, what's your take on the same uh, i won't deviate so much from Miriam's submission, I believe that in fact, these two can coexist. People should take out insurance policies. The good thing with insurance policies, some of them are very specific to a certain nature of emergencies, which is not that. And the, on the other hand, emergency funds are more generalized with all sorts of emergencies, but also they dip. there are so many unexpected things when it comes to emergencies. Even when you set up a fund and start saving towards emergencies, it's not a guarantee that when an emergency kicks in, that fund will be able to help you with a through that storm. Sometimes it's very important. The, the good thing with an investment account compared to a bank account and also an insurance product is here, savings are at your own discretion. You don't face any penalties. And also, compared to a bank account, here there's a certain level of discipline because this money, you can save it in your bank account. But unless there's a certain level of discipline which is instilled in you, which will help you navigate through the times when you feel the urge to withdraw that money, but you wither on and say, no, let this money be in, I set it out for my emergencies. That can only be done either in an investment account or an insurance account. <clears throat> in terms of opening either an investment account or an insurance account, I think you need both. And it, it all depends on your level of income. 
Because currently the insurance products we have in this country are not designed for everyone. And for starters, right now we have some fee investment products which cater for almost everyone. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, John, for that. And as we continue um, on your screen, we should be running the results of the polls. Uh, and we need to see how many people have, um, I mean, voted and what, how long. So here, according to the statistics, uh, about 36% are less than one month. Uh, about 31% of you have said that between one to three months and 25% uh, three to six months. Yes, and about 7% have said they're not really sure, yeah? So literally overall, it is very, very important for you to have a backup plan, which I call an emergency um, fund, yeah? So it is also good to diversify, have a bit of insurance, but also have an emergency fund with uh, with with an investment um, firm, yeah? And uh, just as uh, you are here on the call, I just need each and every one of you take off time today. Today, before you go to sleep, if you do not have an emergency fund, setting up an emergency fund with Zeno is free of charge. It doesn't take you more than even, what, two or three minutes, yeah? If you have at least 10,000 shillings, start with 10,000, yeah? Build that culture in you. You can even do what we call a payroll deduction. You can go talk to your HR and be like, okay, I just need 100,000, even if it's 50,000 every month, deduct it from my salary to my emergency account. Because anytime, I am telling you, anytime an emergency can happen, yeah? We, can, we are not going to avoid it. It can happen. And so for you to um, avoid the repercussions of you not having an emergency account, it is better you start getting prepared for it, yeah, today. So take off some time uh, for those that have Zeno accounts, log into your Zeno account, uh, click uh, emergency goal, set up your emergency goal. Even if it's for a year, for five years, start saving towards that goal, yeah? And uh, for sure, one day, it will really, really help you through uh, that. Uh, so as we go on, I just need to, um, so so just over to you, uh, Miriam and John, uh, what should you do? What, uh, what should someone do when they have uh, actually now used their, or let's say depleted their emergency fund? What is the next step for them? Yeah. Uh, what should they do? Should they um, go ahead and start to, to um, build up another one or should they, um, I don't know what your answers would be, but what would be the next step for them? Over to you, John. Let's start with John. Yeah, thank you, Elijah. The purpose of an emergency fund most importantly is to help you in difficult times so rainy days will come so this is the fund which will help you to take care of your rainy days and putting that money aside should be an ongoing obligation unless you are living this life but as long as you are still in the game of life it should be an ongoing obligation to set aside a given portion of your income to take care of your emergencies depleted it can be depleted anytime but is it being depleted for the right reason because if you are depleting your emergency fund that means that you've achieved the goal which you set it out for it should be a win for you because this emergency fund is taking care of you in difficult times so do you stop there or you build up a new one after you've depleted the last one I would advise that after you've depleted your emergency fund, build up a new fund such that you can better be able to prepare for future emergencies and plan for the unexpected. Thank you, John. Uh, over to you, Miriam. What's your take on that? 
Yeah, definitely. And you know how problems like like it best when you're not prepared. <laughs> in in Luganda, Mamuganda, say in Luganda we have a saying that ekuvu mna So when it comes to problems, if you're not prepared, like they are going to just keep coming and coming back to you. So definitely, if you depleted your emergency fund, you have to build it back. Now we all know building back that fund is not going to be easy, especially when you're still building your savings mass or aids. It's still so hard for you to allocate money to to you, like the different things in your life. Oh, it's still hard for you to follow a budget. It's not going to be easy for you to build it. So just as you're trying to build it, you and things are going to keep happening, just keep asking yourself, can you improvise? Can you wait? You might be having a budget line, say, for eating out. And, and it's still outstanding for that month. You've not eaten out, so that money is already there. But then a situation has come. You don't need to borrow just because it doesn't belong to that budget, just because you don't have a budget line for for what? Like, I'm trying to think of emergencies. What happens to people? <laughs> your child has fallen sick. Yeah, <laughs> You don't need to borrow to take care of your child. You have a budget line of eating out that you've not yet utilized. So improvise, try to switch around things, try to tone down a bit on your lifestyle. Yeah, If you're someone who goes out every now and then, try to tone out, tone up a bit so that you're able to build this up as fast as possible because you're going to definitely need it and it, it's not easy to build it like I've said but you need to build it back up to be able to to live a worry-free life knowing at least you have some level of protection to go about with your life. Thank you very much Miriam. Uh, still on that can we can you take us through um, your step-by-step -step process on how to actually set up an emergency fund? What What steps should we take when we are setting up an emergency fund? So mine, um, I, 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 I like to say you need order in your finances, like the best thing that will ever happen to your finances, apart from having the finances themselves, <laughs> is to have order, yeah, know when to do what, especially when it comes to finances, you cannot roof a house before you do a foundation for it and still you cannot do a foundation before you have a plan else you're going to do you know those houses where a door was supposed to be like five meters from where it is and then if you switch it up the whole structure is going to just crumble so same when it comes to finances so have a plan yeah in place what do you want to say achieve in a given period of time and know what should come when you know those people who start investing before setting up their emergency funds and then two months down the road they are supposed to liquidate their investments john was talking about people who are putting their money in real estate and then emergencies come knocking and then they're supposed to liquidate ending up getting very little money for their structures because they did things in the wrong order so me what i do first is to determine how much money do i need in my emergency fund i reach that value and this figure is going to change and we'll be looking at that later on how much you need and you've shared the results on what different people think so get your number how much do i need how much am i able to save towards that in a month it doesn't mean you get your whole chunk of side like you've determined your emergency fund supposed to be five millions and you earn five million so you put that whole chunk of five million into your emergency fund meanwhile your whole life is just like your life is supposed to continue yeah so you can build it slowly uh, Elijah, you mentioned how you can do like payroll, you, where you talk to your HR and then they do cut off so you can set up auto save. You guys have introduced auto save. Or oh, us who are disciplined, we can just do a standing order to make things easy for us. Like I don't have to think about it, just need to transfer uh, small bits of money to my emergency account. And when it's built up to the 5 million that I want, then I can move on and put that money to something else. So that is what I do, determine the amount, then do um, the deductions to fill up my account. And when it's full, I decide to split it. You see, you, you had mentioned how to split your emergency fund or what goes where. So for me, I advise people 
your emergency vine is supposed to be very very liquid yeah because when a problem comes it has to be sorted immediately so i tell people first put some money on your mobile money account because when that uh, traffic guy stops you they need their money there and then meanwhile zeno uh, is going to give you some two days yeah to withdraw your money like to process so you put in your request there and then you won't be able to get the money or if you have your money on, on a bank account when a situation has faced you, you may not even be near an ATM. You need to sort it out. So at least mobile money can be able to help in that instance. And then I also split my money. First, I've put some on mobile money. Then the rest I'm going to put on my bank account still to, to um, cater for that time lag between when I'll ask for my money to be withdrawn from a unit trust to when it actually hits my account. So on the third bit, this is where I put my money in a unit trust or where I trust it with Zeno. Because as you keep your money, remember for some people, it's a huge chunk of money. You don't want to remain with 10 millions on mobile money. It's losing out. Inflation is happening. So that is why you put on a unit trust so that you're able to earn something on this. Remember, an emergency money is supposed to always be there. So you don't want idle money. You want some money to keep earning something for you. So that is what I do. After I've built up my emergency fund to $5 million, I be I split it between these different channels. And then I just leave it at that. Wait for an emergency to happen. And then I'll do the different transfers. When it gets done, I build it up again. And then just repeat that process. Uh, thank you, Miriam, for that. That was really, really helpful. And I hope each and all of you are actually uh, learning from this. Ladies and gentlemen, there is no Calvary coming. Yeah. Only you can actually uh, take up um, this opportunity and set up an emergency account. There'll be no Calvary coming for you. Yeah. So set up that emergency account with Zeno. Um, just have an emergency account somewhere. Yeah. At least let it be your backup plan so that whenever you need money for an emergency, an emergency, and we have defined an emergency, please, um, that should be your uh, run to point. So right now we shall uh, now dive into the Q&A. Uh, there are a couple of uh, questions in the chat room. Uh, let me just pull them up. Uh, then we can start from there. Uh, to begin with, uh, okay. Um, one more question. Okay, please. Uh, in case you have any questions, please uh, throw them in the in the chat room. Uh. So over to you, John. There is a question from uh, Jen asking, can you elaborate on liquid tools uh, suitable for an emergency fund? Over to you, John. Okay, as yeah, me as illustrate, Miriam has illustrated where we can put a given portion of our emergency funds in a bank account. Yeah, currently a savings and a current account is predominantly the most known liquid item we have in the hierarchy of investments. Though in terms of discipline, yeah, we shall always have emergencies and the purpose of an emergency fund is to reduce the impact of that emergency. Yeah, there will always be emergencies which you didn't plan for. And even if you set up an emergency fund, it doesn't guarantee that 100% you will be able to persevere through an emergency which comes to you. But it reduces the impact it would have done to you. I always live with a famous, a famous quote where I always say that we never want to count on the kindness of strangers for tomorrow's obligations. You don't want to count on the kindness of strangers for tomorrow's obligations. So when setting up in the hierarchy of liquid funds, when you get from bank accounts, the next thing you can go to as a liquid investment would be unit trust funds. This is a new concept in Uganda and very few people have interacted with them. 
it's a growing market and still people don't understand how unit trust funds are executed. But the beauty with unit trust funds are open-ended. You can enter and exit at any time. So setting up your emergency fund with a unit trust fund avails you a time to be able to liquidate your investment in at least three business days, which is not the case with other assets. What goes on after that is a fixed deposit account. Very few people have taken a keen interest in fixed deposit accounts with several banks, some which have more assets even set up call deposits where they can call their funds at any point if they have a good relationship with a bank. The difference between call and fixed deposits is a fixed deposit, you have to agree a tenure, a tenure of that deposit at the time when you are entering into that deposit with a bank. Sometimes they, are, they always range from one month to one year, and you will have a decent return, which will take care of the inflation. But the challenge with it, in case an emergency hits midway through the, before the maturity of that fixed deposit, you may have to pay a penalty to liquidate that fixed deposit. But still, that is still sound investment. Because at the end of the day, you land, you will earn a smaller portion of returns and you will be able to take care of your emergencies. Other than that, when you move up in the hierarchy, some people invest in treasury bills. Currently, our, our government issues treasury bills, which are spaced out in different maturities, but not longer than a year. We have 92, 91-day fee bills. We have 182 and we have 364-day fee bills. Many people have taken a huge interest in investing directly into this. The difference, the drawback to this is you love to pay a smaller portion in taxes at the maturity of the T bills. As you move from T bills, you can move up the ladder depending on how you structured your portfolio. You can go directly into bonds. These range from two years to currently 20 years. And I, I wouldn't expect someone who is setting up an emergency fund to go for bonds, more importantly, those which have a maturity of more than two years, because then you are building up wealth or you are setting up something else other than taking care of emergencies. Yeah, given the hype which is ongoing with Airtel is expected IPO, some people would want to go directly into equities. At, I wouldn't recommend someone who is setting up an emergency fund to go directly and invest in equities or buy shares on Uganda Securities Exchange or any other exchange other than the, this exchange. Because the, the returns from equities are quite volatile and they are non-linear. There might be time when you may even experience losses. And for someone who has set up an account, it will be very important that you guard your emergency fund against any loss in value, because then it won't serve the purpose which you set it out for. Then as you move on that hierarchy, you also have to keep a keen eye on scams. Given we operate in an industry which is regulated, but there are so many scams out there, as you are aware of the ongoing scam which is running of capital chicken, which has been promising people superior returns. Just imagine you had set up your emergency fund in such an investment scheme. Right now, you would be going together with your emergency. So as you look at the hierarchy of investment, you have to also take care of where you are placing your money. Is it in a regulated entity? And how do you recover it in case something happens? These are some of the things you have to take into consideration. Some also, sometimes we have to want to experiment with offshore investments, but these are not designed to take care of emergencies. These are designed for wealthy individuals who want to diversify their investments. Thank you. That is it, Elaine. 
Uh, thank you very much, John, for that. That was really, really so insightful. Uh, and I hope uh, people will definitely learn from that. Uh, over to you, Miriam. Uh, just to ask, in case uh, one gets an emergency bigger than their emergency fund, what should they do? What are the next steps? Yeah, so what you would do first is to ask yourself again, can you improvise? Can it wait? Like, is it urgent, urgent? Yeah. <laughs> so if it can't wait, then definitely you cannot avoid going to friends. Yeah. And that's why you need to keep a good relationship with your friends. And that is why you need to set up an emergency fund in the first place. Because if you're this person who is always borrowing from your friends, you've never paid back many of the old debts. And now a, a real big thing hits you. There's no one to turn to because you've already spoiled all these relationships. Yeah. So, yeah, first, your emergency fund is depleted. Do you have any other resources? Uh, if you have, well, go ahead and get them. If you have some assets that you can easily liquidate, go ahead and liquidate. Yeah. If you don't have anything, go to your friends. Keep a good relationship with your friends and stop borrowing from your friends unnecessarily. Yeah. This is the only point. This is the only point in your life you should ever go to your friends. Why you don't have assets or why your assets cannot easily be liquidated. Yeah. Other points, please wait or find other means. Friends fail, go to family. Why am I putting friends and family? Because borrowing from from, from family sometimes it's it's not easy. Yeah. Friends sometimes can understand you better, but some family dynamics are not like really good. But if your family dynamics are, are okay and you find it easier to borrow from family, go ahead and do that. The other part, then you can get a loan. Yeah. And wait, before you get a loan, you have to be sure you're able to pay back. So why is the loan coming last is because you don't want to be sorting your emergency because sometimes some emergencies take take really long. Yeah. You've you found yourself in some situation. Maybe your house has totally collapsed, like something has happened, and then some guys just showed up and hit up your home and it's gone. Like you need to find somewhere to to sleep. That situation is going to take some very long period of time for you to get out of. Yeah? So that is why you don't easily run to loans. And this is what most people do their car gets hit up and they're running to loan sharks. These guys are charging 20% per month. That is why you're, you're like in that endless cycle of debt. So try these other means first before you end up with a loan. The loan is the very last resort. I'll tell someone to do. Elijah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Miriam. Still on you. Uh, there is a question from Andrew CJ. He's saying, so usually... I uh, employ the 50, 30, 20 rule on my salary, where 50 goes to my expenses, 30 to my luxury, and 20 to my investment and savings. So from the above breakdown, which part should I get money for the emergency from? Because as per this moment, my side hustle savings are my emergency fund. Over to you, Miriam. Thanks. Well, um, I, I don't like that concept of my side hustle savings or my emergency. Your emergency fund is actually a, a given amount of money. Yeah. I don't want this endless contribution of money to an emergency fund. It should have a set amount. Like my emergency fund is five millions. Have I hit the five millions? Oh, my emergency fund is one million. If I hit one, my one million, then your money can go to those other things. And then a 50, 30, um, 20 rule. Why I don't like these rules is you end up um, missing some bits. You end up having idle money somewhere or an overexpenditure somewhere. That is why I always tell people to itemize their budgets as much as possible. Don't just say 50% is going towards your needs yet if you itemize this you'll find that your needs are actually 10 percent of your income so you're really like spending a lot of money instead of adding that extra to investment so a lot of things get hidden into those percentages best you itemize everything to that detail and then you allocate money accordingly so instead of just saying 10 percent is going towards my 
emergency fund set aside a certain amount. My emergency fund is one million. I, I need to build it because it's 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 so critical for you to build up your emergency fund as fast as possible. If you can do it in one month, well and good. Yeah, so that you move on. So if you're able to build it in one month, do it and then this you, you allocate the different amount separately. If you're doing it in different instances, you can be able to allocate 50% in the first month to your emergency fund, or you can be able to allocate 10%, depending on how, how much you earn. So just build it to the point that you've set and just let it be. Only touch it when there is an emergency after going through the other three-step model that we mentioned. Yeah, thank you very, very much, uh, Miriam for the submission uh, over to you john uh, and these are the last two questions i will ask uh one from edward is asking if i have set up my emergency fund kindly guide me on how i can jealously guard myself from touching it luxuriously and the second question is with zeno can i save uh, any amount monthly over to you john yeah the first Thing is, that's the reason why I always recommend people to set up their emergency funds as investment accounts, not bank accounts. In fact, you can keep your emergency funds money in a bank account. But if you are disciplined enough to leave it there when there are some ones, in case you don't, you are not disciplined enough, it will be recommended that you start out with an investment account. This investment account, you can get it anywhere. It's not only a thing you can do with Zeno, but the beauty with Zeno, if you are genuine about being disciplined and you don't want to touch your investment, you can go ahead and set up a withdrawal lock, which limits you from even thinking of withdrawing that money before an emergency pops up. That's the, that is a unique feature which you will only find with Zeno. And also, people always confuse savings and emergencies. For example, who receive monthly income? For example, someone who said that I apportion my salary in these buckets, 50, 30, 20. The 20 you are putting aside is for saving. That is maybe you are building wealth. That 20% is not for emergencies. We have to be clear on which money are we setting aside for emergencies and which man are we saving maybe to build well or to acquire assets in future that is that has to be explicit at the time when you set out this and when it comes out to zeno on the frequency of investment the beauty as i said earlier zeno executes goal-based investment so in this case setting up an emergency is your goal but we execute goal-based investment using unit trust funds and the way in it trust funds were designed, they are collective investment schemes where people can exit and enter at any time. With this, it means you can deposit and withdraw at any one point when you did this. But since this is an investment account, withdrawing is not instant as you do with your ATM when you have a bank account. Here, withdrawing requires that part of your assets have to be liquidated before you receive your money. That's why it usually takes one to three business days. But on our side, it takes one day, maximum three business days. But you can deposit from anywhere. You can deposit using any channel. And you can guarantee you can receive a deposit confirmation and you can track where your money is invested. So for someone who is asking whether they can invest when and how, yeah, the team can reach out to give you the several options which you can use for investing. And also the misconception we always have when we are setting up investment accounts. People always set up accounts with only returns in mind. And when I look at most of the questions and when I interact with people to set up their investment account, those start saving for their future or their old age. The question which comes to mind very fast is, what is my annual return? 
And what, that's what scams have taken advantage of. Since people are more interested in returns, not investment as a whole, because you can't evaluate an investment in terms of returns only. You have to evaluate an investment taking into consideration other aspects like the risk, like the liquidity, the diversification and other components which form making an investment account. I will advise that when you reach a point of setting up an investment account and you can't do it on your own, please seek guidance from a financial or an investment advisor such that you set it up correctly. Thank you, John, uh, very much. And just that he has just said on the point of um, booking meetings with uh, an investment advisor on the uh, Zeno webpage, there is uh, the option of help. When you click it, you should be getting the option of talk to an advisor. You can book uh, a 15 minutes to a 30 minutes call. It's free of charge, guys, it's free, free of charge. So please, uh, in case you have friends, you have family, and they need to talk to an advisor, just go to the Zeno website uh, under the help option, and you'll be able to uh, book a meeting with uh, an investment advisor, and then you can start, um, you can get that kind of help. Now, this marks the end of our webinar. I am really, really excited and grateful for all those that have joined us today. And to our panelists, John and Miriam, I am very, very delighted uh, to have hosted you today. And uh, we hope next time we, uh, we meet again and uh, give them uh, more knowledge uh, about finances and managing them. Yeah, so um, as we conclude, Please go to our social media pages. Uh, please um, go to our YouTube channel. That is uh, Zeno Investments. Uh, please uh, like, share, and subscribe. Uh, for our Twitter, we also do have a Twitter at MyZeno. And then also, uh, uh, we also have an Instagram page. Please also go like and share. Uh, so literally try to share as much as you can to your friends, to your colleagues, and let them know about uh, investments and how they can actually secure their future so let's help our friends plan save and invest for their financial goals so this uh i remain elijah and i uh, hope to meet you next month for another webinar thank you very much and have a good night thanks have a good night thanks have a good night